<laughs> okay, welcome to the sixth online meeting of the Max, uh, the Max Weber Scholars Network on the topic Weber Finance and Capitalism. Uh, I'm Edith Hanke and the former technical editor of the historical critical Max Weber Gesamtausgabe. Weber Scholars Networks brings together scholars with a wide range of research interests related to Max and even Marianne Weber. Our website has a variety of resources from Weber experts and we have a newsletter with the latest works and events on Weber and we send them out regularly. For more information and to join the network, please access our website. It is a pleasure to open up the meeting with our speaker, Sam Wimster, and commentator, Misha Suta, today. Victor will be moderating the discussion later on. He is still stuck on the train from Berlin to Geneva. It's the problem of the Deutsche Bahn. So I will open the meeting and hand over to Victor after Sam's and Misha's presentation. First, I would like to briefly present the course of the evening. Sam Wimster will present his comprehensive thesis paper, and I think it will be approximately 20 minutes. And then Misha Zutter will comment on it. After that, Sam has the opportunity to reply to Misha if he wishes. And afterwards, all meeting participants have the opportunity to ask questions to discuss the topic, and we will end the session around 8 p.m. But now it's high time to introduce you to the key speakers. Sam Wimster, um, will be familiar to most of you as a longtime founder and editor of the Weber Studies in London. Since 2000, two issues have been published each year. In this way, Sam makes an invaluable contribution to international Weber research and to the networking of the various disciplines and national knowledge cultures. As a translator and editor, I would particularly like to highlight his works Understanding Weber, Rutledge, 2007, and together with Hans-Henrik Brun, Max Weber collected methodological writings five years later. Sam Wimster is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the Global Policy Institute, London, and so the international financial markets are his real subject. He is the co-author of the book Federal Central Banks 2018. And for our Max Weber Oxford Handbook, he has supervised the first part on economy and capitalism in a globalized world. And he himself made the contribution on economics and society and the late of liberal capital and the fate of liberal capitalism. Sam Wimster's commentator today is Misha Suta, a Swiss historian, or should I say economic historian, and assistant professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute. His research and teaching are concerned with the history of capitalism and the history of the human sciences in colonialism. His first monograph, Rechtstrieb, Schulden und Vollstreckung im liberalen Kapitalismus, was published in 2016 in German and then 2021 in an English translation. This book examines everyday indebtedness in 19th century liberal capitalism in Switzerland. A recently completed book manuscript, his habilitation thesis, traces conflicts over money in a societal medium in global German history from 1871 to 1923. Currently, he is the principal investigator of a five-year research project on the history of ethnopsychology. And so we can look forward to an exciting discussion on the subject of Weber, finance, and capitalism tonight. Stem will start with his paper on Weber and stock exchange 
a topic that, as Sam says, is so esoteric and special, uh, and special that we are dependent on expert knowledge. Please, Sam, you have our attention. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Edith, for the introduction. Um, yes, the, I mean, just those who are not quite familiar with the topic, let me just present the Max Weber Gesamthaus Gaba, two volumes on it, which were published in 1999 under the superb editorship of Knut Borchardt and just opening volume two, it goes up to, yeah, uh, 1100 pages. And anybody who looks at this, this work, extensive series of publications on the stock exchange that Max Weber undertook through the decade of the 1890s, there is one sentence, the, the expert technical exposition of stock exchange trading, um, which presents a lot of problems to the reader today. Um, now, faced with that problem, I'll say something, first of all, about the background, because I think it, the background to his writings is just as important as the writings themselves. Um, now, the fundamental contradiction which drove the Bourse, what should we say, Bourse, French, Bourse and German Stock Exchange, English, um, was a huge social and political need to protect the public and the private investor and Schmoller says there were about one and a half to two million of them uh, on the one side. Uh, and on the other side, the need for a, a functioning stock exchange that kept pace with the development of the economy, which, of course, was moving into a high industrialised phase. Um, so a liberal open trading economy uh, had moved on to the joint stock company, which issued shares and a stock exchange that was required for trading in shares. Um, Wolfgang Momsen makes the point that Weber's main priority, and this is also reflected in Borchardt's introduction, um, the, the value of the national state in international geopolitics was the highest priority or value. And in this sense, Weber argued uh, Germany must have strong banks, a functioning stock exchange, and the capacity to deal in futures for grain prices. And various economic arguments are put forward that with grain prices in America, in Chicago, one needed to know what they were in, in the Berlin Stock Exchange, for instance. Um, the German Stock Exchange, from what I can work out, was more or less unregulated. Um, and this compares with the London Stock Exchange, where membership was a closed shop. It was self-regulated, was the London Stock Exchange, and enforced by a rigorous honour code. Members could be blackballed for not honouring contracts and stock exchange firms could be hammered, as they say, for their mistakes. That is completely put out of business. Um, and if you read some of the historical novelists of that time, Trollope, uh, it's a source of great shame and anxiety whether a stock exchange firm is hammered and all the investors lose their savings. And that seems to be the sort of literary theme also in Germany, uh, whether one looks at Thomas Mann, I think I mentioned Buddenbrook somewhere, uh, where you find that uh, part of the, on the female side of the family, whenever they get married, uh, Tony Buddenbrook 
marries a bounder. Her daughter marries another fraudster, and so the the um, the 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 whole value, the capital value of the firm declines because of these fraudulent activities and unreliable people. Um, so this was, you know, a very real theme that the public had to be protected and the um, and the stock exchange, people who, who operated in the stock exchange were seen widely as fraudsters and crooks, market manipulators and so on. So the public opinion on this was really very strong. And throughout the 1890s and before, there were a number of scandals on the German stock exchanges, bank failures. Um, and so the public felt, or the middle class public felt that their savings uh, were not properly secured and that, that there had to be state legislation in other words, as the Germans call it, positive state law should be introduced to regulate what is now called casino capitalism. Um, in other words, it was seen as simply gambling um, and that therefore there ought to be some sort of regulation. And also there was the moralistic prohibition about making money from money, the idea of usury which was still strong. Um, I mean, if, if you go back and read Buddenbrooks, there is a very strong uh, honor code, moralistic view of what's right and proper in business dealings and what's not. And the whole novel turns on, you know, these sinkholes of, <laughs> of money disappearing because somebody's unreliable. Um, so both Lutheran morality and Catholic morality were really stood against the sorts of things that were going on in the stock exchange. Weber says it's difficult to control because the Germans have a mania for gambling. So that's the other side of the sort of Lutheran mentality is that lots of people like to gamble. So it must have been something like you know, crypto speculation in Bitcoin and that today. Um, and Weber's position was like the one we have today, really, with, with cryptocurrencies. If you're foolish enough to put your money in it as a form of speculation, then that's your fault. You know, you can't be rescued. Uh, right. So that's some of the background to... Uh, stock exchange inquiries. Now, there's also a political side to this, which is also interesting. And I mean, going back to it, I have to admit, I did not read these two volumes from cover to cover. <laughs> um, and uh, there's quite a good translation, actually, in theory and society of a of a article Max Weber wrote for Naumann's Workers' Library in Die Helfe. In fact, he wrote two articles, one in 1894 and one in 1896. And the 1896 article has been published. Um, can't quite see that, Edith. Hold it up to the camera closer. This is a copy of the translation. Isn't yes. it? The manuscript translated by the yeah the guy from Princeton yeah yeah, um, yeah. It, it's uh, it's a pretty good translation though Gunter Roth said something was wrong with it but I can't remember what exactly it was I haven't gone over it word for word um, but uh, it's a remarkable piece of German writing considering he was writing it for workers I mean it's it. They say it's easier German, but I think it's Knut Borchardt who said that. 
it, it's it's he was making an effort to with his sentences, but <laughs> there are some very long sentences in there. But when you read it properly, and it, it is a pretty good account of what's going on. Now, Weber was drawn into this. Um, let's just go back to my previous point about the political background. The agrarians, that is to say the farmers, the landlords who owned the large estates east of the Elbe and grew grain, they had farms that were uncompetitive in world markets. Um, because grain coming across from Ukraine, which was then Russia, and from the United States was cheaper. So their solution, uh, going back to the 1870s, end of the 1870s, was really to put a tariff for on grain imports. Um, and that was greatly resented. I mean, the whole of British 19th century economic history turns on the Corn Laws, which got rid of uh, tariffs and undermined the landed aristocracy in the name of um, open market colonial capitalism. Um, so the whole debate about whether you have food tariffs or not is highly political. It's, it's the heart of political economy. And authors like Ricardo, you know, every major economist wrote on this subject and it was the centre point of British politics for at least 20 or 30 years. Well, the agrarians won out in Germany, mostly. Um, and there were... The pushback, I suppose, came in 1890, when Caprivi became Chancellor, because Bismarck effectively backed the agrarians and ran a politics which divided the political classes, working class, middle class, the Zentrum Partei, which was the uh, Catholic party. And he undermined democracy in the parliament, the Reichstag. Um, and Caprivi was known as putting forward a new course in the sense that political democracy to an extent should be brought back. That is to say, there would be more rule through representation of political parties and therefore of social classes through the Reichstag. Um, and that he started making treaties with Romania and Russia and really tried to open German economy up and trade policy to um, a free trade situation. And in this, he was viciously opposed by the agrarian lobbies, who became really the first interest group, lobbying group, and very successful um, form of, of um, propaganda and operating through the media. And in particular, they used the, the moral arguments, you know, the don't really like this sort of uh, what's going on in the stock exchange. In particular, you it was a form of gambling because, just get technical, technical for a moment, because the termines geschäft was really a futures trade. You were taking out a, a contract on the future price of grain. And of course, that was very important for millers who wanted flour as a fixed price. They didn't want to see the price vary throughout the year because their pricing policy would be undermined. And um, it was also important for farmers who wanted to know they would get a, a definite price, uh, whatever happened during the harvesting and through the summer. You know. um, so future prices were an important part of the armory of the stock exchange and Max Weber was emphatically in favour of them. He said, this is how capitalism works. This is how it's been operating in other countries and uh, in mass markets and mass consumption, you just have to have these instruments 
to stabilize the price rather than have it bouncing around. And you did that through future options. And you'll find future options, say, uh, you know, in chapter one of macroeconomics, at least it was when I did my economics course, um, that stabilizing the price was a very important part of uh, applied economics. The problem with them was that nobody knew quite what was happening because these contracts got passed from dealer to dealer within the stock exchange and you could make speculative gains from them. You could renege on them because they weren't, um, it was difficult to know what was going on. And that's why the London Stock Exchange had an advantage because if people were doing um, corrupt or crooked deals, uh, it would be known to the other members of the Stock Exchange and that person could be, as they say, blackballed, ostracized and not allowed to work in the stock exchange. Um, now, Caprivi fell in 1894. And this is where we come to the very interesting part of the political structure of, of Germany. And that effectively it was a polyarchy. Um, power was distributed between three or four well, let's count them up. There was the Bund Bundestag right, which was the uh, the Reichstag, which was obviously the the main democratic forum, the parliament, and people were elected to that on male universal franchise. It wasn't equal because it was gerrymandered, but that was the main political institution. Uh, then there was the Bundesrat, which was like it an upper house, but it was really a federal chamber of the 19 or so big states like Saxony, Bavaria. Uh, then you had the Hansa towns, Hamburg. Everybody was represented, Baden, uh, in the Bundesrat, but on a princely or kingly basis. It wasn't democratic. It was the federal chamber. That's what it means, Bundesrat. And then you had the personal rule of, of, of Kaiser Wilhelm II. Uh, this was very influential. How influential is difficult to tell. Um, I've got a... Who's, who's a there's a historian, what's his name? Yeah, John Roll did a huge three-volume uh, book on Wilhelm. Uh, and he makes Wilhelm the whole centre of this polyarchy. Um, historians like Wolfgang Momsen disagreed with that, um, and also Winkler wouldn't have agreed with that. But nevertheless, through through Rohl's work, you really can see how uh, Wilhelm II undermined his chancellors, and he undermined Caprivi. And so there was a court intrigue, um, which... Uh, Caprivi lost out to. Um, and really what was happening here was that Caprivi, excuse me, Caprivi was really replacing the Bismarck regime and Bismarck's modus operandi for something more openly political. And then when Caprivi was brought down and this decrepit old man Hohenlohe, um, Prince Su Hohenlohe, what was he? Schilling first and is the full name anyway. We'll call him Hohenlohe. Um, he basically became a weak chancellor through which Kaiser went, wanted to rule. And really what was happening here was, in my view, was that the Kaiser was trying to replace, make himself the new Bismarck. Yeah? Now, this, this is important because if you follow all the famous publications on the stock exchange, they wind through all these institutions, right? I've got a list of it here. Let's have a look. Um, right. 
Caprivi sets up a stock exchange inquiry, and this is a major investigative operation. It's the commission. And it took a couple of years and it produced 5,000 pages of documentation. Um, it was started in the Reich office, that is to say, in the executive, I suppose we'd call it now, um, by an important politician, Heinrich von Bottischer. I mean, he was a powerful politician and he could hold his own in this polyarchy. Um, and he chaired and got the appointments and representatives onto this commission. Um, then in 1894, the proposals were put to the Bundesrat, yeah, and then the Reichstag. And this then opened up a huge debate because the liberals, the national liberals, were, and the industrialists obviously wanted uh, wanted to stop tariffs and they wanted free trading, especially in the stock exchange. Um, and the agrarians were, were against it and well organized to, to propagandize against it. Um, and Caprivi is important because he's he's against the agrarians. Now Hohenlohe was was inclined to the agrarian point of view, to the extent that he even suggested that economic autarky would be an option for Germany. It would become a closed economy, shut off from the world economy, which seems fantastic to us now. But it was a, it was a serious position. Max Weber took that on in a debate with Oldenburg. That that, that brief piece he wrote on uh, what was it? Industry Industry or the a grass start. Um, so, and so that was for real, even though it seems a little unbelievable now. So then we get. A, a, a Borsen Gazette's Entwurf. This was a bill went to the Reichstag committee. Um, I went to a committee in the Reichstag where the agrarians were a minority. And uh, they may try to um, change it away from the agrarian point of view. Um, and then there were four readings in the Reichstag, uh, which looked to have been very contentious. You know, it was the debate of the day whether you should allow futures trading. You know, as if it was the number one item in, in public opinion and in the newspapers. Um, and then it went back to the Bundesrat. And in the Bundesrat, um, a committee was formed to consider it. I mean, the, basically, the bill had been passed in the Reichstag, and it was against freedom of trading in futures. And when you look at it closely, it's not clear what actually was passed, but uh, there was definitely a forbode against futures trading in grain and certainly in other products. The Bundesrat wanted to create a subcommittee because it wanted control over stock exchange policy because it, it was a debate that wasn't going to stop. And so they called up representatives for their committee. And that's where Max Weber actually became part of this committee on the basis of his already extensive writings on the stock exchange. Uh, and he wrote an important report of the Bundesrat com uh, Committee's deliberations, um, for which he was attacked in the press, the liberal press and obviously in the agrarian press. So the Conservatives versus the Liberals. So Max Weber was caught in that crossfire. Though he was quite clear that there should be freedom of trading of futures options. Uh, he never changed his position on that. 
he didn't say conditions and the organization of the stock exchanges should be changed, which could make improvements, but basically the principle of free trading futures, as we would say, derivatives now, was his position. Um, and then in April 1897, Weber was taken off the committee in place of representatives of trade and industry. And there were two professors on the committee, him and somebody called Lexis, and they were, if you like, the professorial, neutral, expert opinion, though in fact Weber wasn't neutral. He was, he was definitely for uh, a liberal stock exchange. And then um, so Weber was no longer needed and all this work stopped. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's very odd in a career sense that you work on something for 10 years, you produce this huge mass of material on the central issue of the day. And the implication must be that he wanted to be, a, I think, a, a permanent member of the advisory committee to the Bundesrat. But that fell away. And in part, the new civil code, which came out at this time, in this, this same year, I think it was 1897, superseded the Borsen Gazettes from the Reichstag. So the whole thing sort of fell away and Weber no longer had any role. And as we know, 1897 was when his breakdown started and he was going, having therapy and, and, and he never returned to the subject again. Now, I better, how long have I been going for? A bit too long. Um, yes, maybe if you agree we can stop here and then we have your further talking points maybe for the discussion this is okay sam but so I'll, then... I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing i mean yeah. <laughs> uh i mean, I'll just summarize what i've said so it's very difficult to follow the, the writings themselves though in fact if you read them they make they clear they, they are clear, but it is such a complicated field in itself. Um, uh, it takes quite a lot of effort just to explain it. But really what I've tried to, to suggest is the sort of social political background, the political background, the interest. And within the German state itself, this polyarchy, and of course, one should also remember that there were stock exchanges in Hamburg, Berlin, Cologne, um, Munich. Was there one in Augsburg? Uh, there was one in Breslau. Uh, and so that was the federal nature of, of the state as well. Um, and what I would go on to talk about, and we, perhaps this can be taken up in the discussion, is that I'll just put it in one sentence that it was a brilliant training to become an economist because he's studying markets firsthand, it really does. Mm. So I'll conclude there. Fine, Sam. Thank you so much. And then Misha will comment on it and then we can start the discussion for all participants. So, Misha, it's on to you. Yeah, thank you so much. And also thanks from my side for the invitation and, and giving me the opportunity to uh, comment on um, Sam's uh, very rich presentation that um, <clears throat> emphasizes the complexity of the field and the complexity of the of, of contexts. And I um, very much um, agree with that, and 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 in that spirit, I would only um, <clears throat> try to make um, three points. Um, one would um, kind of um, pick up on the question of historical context. The second would be um, how, um, and that would be more than also a a, a question to, um, towards the audience. How could we um, 
connect some of um, these writings to key concepts and concerns in, 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 in Weber's thought. And here, as an amateur, as an outsider, as someone who's absolutely not a Weber specialist, I um, you know, claim the privilege of naivete to, to push you um, specialists a little bit on, on that question. And, and then I have a, sec a third point on credit money, because I find this in, in, the, in, in Sam's written paper very um, intriguing. And maybe we get to that, but maybe we, um, we will, um, um, uh, maybe our, our, our discussion will, will, will circle more about um, the question of um, Weber's key concepts and, and his um, concrete and very practical writings on, 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 on the Börse. Um, so, <clears throat> the um, um, börse or stock exchanges or booths um, were uh, not only um, issues of um, strong political and social debate, as Sam has um, emphasized, but also um, um, rich fields of um, theoretical contemporary um, reflection. And, and, and Max Weber is one, is, is, is one example of that. Um, other examples would, for instance, um, in the US context um, involve um, and, and Chief Justice um, Oliver Vandal Holmes, who in 1905 drew on William James's um, pragmatist philosophy in order to grasp the, the actual workings of um, future contracts. Um, and um, and uh, um, um, in, in the, um, in the um, uh, person on get um, um, committee, um, you would have um, um, both um, economists and uh, social reformers and um, 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 social theorists such as Weber who who would um, uh, um, re reflect on that phenomenon of the of the stock exchange as as a phenomenon of um, contemporary capitalism? That's why they also held a um, theoretical interest in it. And I could uh, maybe just um, give you a quote by um, Gustav Pohn. I, I put it in the chat um, and and read it to you um, um, from. This is actually already from 1866, where he says that the Börse was ohne Zweifel ein eminent kennzeichnendes Resultat unserer gesamten wirtschaftlichen Entwicklung. Der klassische Ort der kosmopolitischen freien Konkurrenz, die Doktrin der Free Traders in vorbildlicher Erscheinung. Die mächtige Zentralisierung der Preise, nicht für ein Land allein, sondern für ganz Europa, am Ende für den ganzen Erdkreis. Die rapide Ausgleichung nach allen Richtungen, die Verbindung von vergangenen und zukünftigen in blitzschneller Vorausberechnung kommender Dinge aus dem Zusammenwirken einer Menge von Nachrichten und Meinungen, die einander bekämpfen und am Ende ins Ebene setzen. Mit all diesem ist die Börse ein And now I think that's important. Ein abgekürztes Bild der Idee des Handels überhaupt. Ein abgekürztes Bild der Idee des Handels überhaupt. A, a, an, an abridged um, 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 total picture or totality of the, of the very idea of trade um, um, itself. And um, so... And, and and Weber in uh, when when he's presenting um to the um uh, you, you know at the uh, at the at, at the workers association makes very makes very um, um similar points um so um the the the, the, the Börse as a phenomenon of of modernity of of of, of acceleration of centralization of of globality and uh, as a sort of an essence of, of, of modern capitalism. So for me, this raises a, 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 a couple of questions. So one would be, and, and here I would be very interested in your opinion on that. Um, what is, for someone like Weber, the 
nexus or the contradiction between the historical contingency of a phenomenon like the Börse or futures trading on one hand versus the rational necessity of um, uh, the, the phenomenon. So if, 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 if the Börse is, um, is, is, is capitalism put to its extreme or, or put to its, its, its finality, then is, 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 is there some necessity to, to this uh, phenomenon? And, and so, so here I would be very interested in yours, um, um, in, your pos in, in your position on that. And um, another point, maybe even or um, a generalized would be what is for Weber while looking at a phenomenon like the 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 birth, uh, like the the, the birth, uh, the nexus between or the contradiction between rationality on one hand and all these um, supposed or um, um, an apparent irrationality um, happening on the trading floor. So we would have so we would have some sort of tension on one hand of as as the as the as the as the person as the as the uh, as the epitome of rationality on one hand. And on the other hand we have all these uh, um depictions of the person as 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 an outgrowth of irrationality of mimetic behavior and self-referentiality of of um and I think that's important too of play. Um, so there is this person, uh, this the, the, the German expression of Börsenspiel, um, which actually then um, also um, um, a kind of um, um, is in, in, in stark tension to, um, uh, to ideas of rationality and ideas of, of, of seriousness. Um, the, so, so, so here then the, the, the Börse is unserious. So uh, since Weber has this very strong um, um, a kind of um, setup on the, the the question of rationality on one hand and emotion on 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 the other in 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 a lot of his writing. So I uh, would be very interested in your thoughts um, on 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 that as well. And then um, a third point connected to his central concepts would be so if. For someone like Gustav Kohn, the, the Börse is an abgekürztes Bild der Idee des Handels überhaupt. For, you know, for an outsider like me, who's naive, my question would be, okay, is the Börse something that helps uh, someone like Weber to come up with his main model idea uh, that would be the, the ideal type? Is, is the Börse the ideal type of, um, of 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 modern capitalism, or is the Börse something that helps Weber come to um, that mode of model building um, that then uh, leads um, to his um, um, uh, methodological or, or epistemological um, concepts such as um, um, uh, the ideal type and. Um, yeah, so so these would be uh, my uh, three points. I would be very interested in in hearing from you. Um, question of of historical contingency versus necessity. Question of rationality versus emotion with respect to the Bourse, and um, question of um, the Bourse. The, the relation between the boards and 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 the model building of ideal types. Um, I think I'll leave it there. But but maybe we in the discussion we still can talk about um, credit money because I'm be tremendously interested in <laughs> learning more about credit money or Weber's thinking about credit money because it would be so yeah um, because the um, sources he would draw on would be very diverse and. And and also contradictory. So so I'd be very very interested in you hearing you also on on credit money, but, but maybe we stick more to the boards for now. And so so these would be my questions to Sam and of course all of you who are uh, Weber Weber scholars. Thank you. Yes, thank you. 
so much. <laughs> um, these are very good questions and points I think we can discuss on. And I see Victor has arrived home. So he will take over the moderation of the discussion now. Welcome <laughs> to us, Victor. So, um, Sam, yeah, do you ahead. like to answer first or? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sam. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Misha, thank, thank, you know, this is, this makes this sort of Zoom seminar so, so wonderful because, you know, just trying to pin down the, the balls and shrift and is so hard that having somebody else come in and say, have you considered these questions? No, I haven't, but <laughs> <laughs> give me another week, I might have got there. But you, you, you know, I think that these, these are very important questions. Um, now, the on I said it right at the end. Uh, you know, I thought it, it, this study was important for him as an economist. Now, that's not quite the same as your question, which is the later Weber, which is the man of the ideal type and epistemological sophistication. The straightforward point on being an economist is that I noticed this especially in De Helfa, the which I think is the 1896 article, the one that's been translated. Um, he, he he almost describes it in a phenomenological, you know, you, you can see it's almost visible. He's in the exchange itself. Somebody walks up and says, brief, uh, 100 mark, and uh, that means who's going to bid for it. And then somebody replies and he describes it in a face to face way in which these bits of paper are bidded for prices are contracted. And then, the you know, the piece of paper goes on to A, B, C, D, all many other players in the stock exchange. And this idea, and then he describes the London Stock Exchange where they sell bonds uh, through an auction. So all the bond dealers turn up and there's an auction. And in fact, that still goes on today. Um, except it goes on electronically, but basically they, they sell gilts every month or so and, you know, they offer a price and so there's what's called price discovery going on here. And this is one of the central issues in theoretical economics. Um, namely, how do you discover a price in a market? Now, with Leon Valra, um, I'm sure Hino can come in on this better than I can, um, said that there is a kind of, what's the word, tatonomal? Um, there's kind of auction going on uh, to discover the price. Well, Weber, Weber does that. And the other thing that, I mean, he's not explicit about this. So I don't, you know, there's a negative answer to your question, Misha. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's the actuality of it that, that impressed me. Uh, this isn't a theoretician, though if he wanted to put it out, he could have come up with a um, a, uh, a theoretical account of what was going on. And the other thing is Evartal ex expectations is very important in his sociology. Uh, indeed, it's the whole idea of Evartal and Orientierung, uh, on which his theory of social, you know, handle theory is based on and what you have going on in a stock exchange is the expectations of price and so you have a subjective expectation of price uh, and when the price is concluded at the end of the day or the settlement period at the end of the month you've got an objective price and actually that's something that Bertram Sheffield has has, has raised in his Einleitung to the uh, Wirtschaftsgeschichte, uh, which is coming out in Max Weber studies soon, I should say, and also in Zeitklos. Um, so 
that would be my answer. So he's he's learning a lot um, from the experience. Now, the irrationality, emotional side of it, the spiel. Um, he more or less ignores that, I would say. I mean, people may have a different opinion. So what you've got is is Max Weber making sense of the world rationally. Mm -hmm. You could almost go the other way and say he's imposing rationality on something which we now know is deeply irrational. And I once worked with an Australian sociologist and um, she and Helena Flam and uh, Pixley. Um, they did a book on sort of emotions in finance. You know, just it's to do economic rationality is is made such a priority in, in the economics and financial economics today because it's the underlying ideology in my view that when people come in and say well this is totally irrational it's gambling which we now know it is since since we've got this sort of what we call post big bang um when you look at trading today the whole thing is is mostly irrational in my view whereas Weber's saying no no it's rational it can be rationally analyzed he says these price movements can be brought down to just little ripples out of sea on the breeze um so that would be my answer to that one the just a note on credit it must have occurred to him that these people were dealing with credit notes, not contract notes. And that comes out much later in the general economic history, which is 1919. Um, but uh, bills of exchange are credit notes, which can be go into uh, a um, stock exchange and be traded. So it becomes a form of credit money. Um, I looked back to the his lectures on general or universal theoretical economics, which he gave in Freiburg between and Paderberg, eighteen ninety four to eighteen ninety eight or so, um, and you can't. I couldn't work out whether he had transferred any of that theory of credit money to his lecture notes. Um, maybe worth somebody having another look but so I think so what I'm saying is we're at a pre-theoretical stage mm -hmm. at this point thank you all right so um thanks for the patience and well thanks for the intervention so far uh, if you have any questions just raise your hand virtual hand or or real one and we'll go to you I wanted to pick up on Misha's provocations to the Weberians in a way. Uh, my question to, to both Sam and, and Misha was actually, what does this say about Weber as a, as a political economist? Is, is this text, you know, is that the frame that we should see it in? Or what kind of thinker of the, uh, of the economy is this Weber at this point in his trajectory? Because I went back to the, to the Nauman uh, addition so to, to these popularizing texts that he wrote about the stock exchange, especially the first one. So I guess it's not the one that's been translated to English. And I was surprised to how we already find some traits um, that will define him later on. But before I, I, I give some suggestions as to in what ways that that's the case and where do we see Weber becoming Weber in this text to, to respond to, to Misha, I do think there are elements of it. It's a great source actually to understand how his concept concept of capitalism or how his understanding of capitalism emerges, right? For the genesis of his concept of capitalism. And I, uh, I think it's very important. This is also a point uh, I make in my book that the fact that he conceptualizes capitalism at this period in history is, is key, right? None of these, uh, none of these phenomena is new uh, per se, 
the, the stock the stock exchange itself, financial markets. Uh, they've been they've been going on since the Middle Ages, and Weber's exactly written on this before, as, as Sam highlighted. But the fact that he's conceptualizing capitalism at a moment where finance is becoming central, where you have massive international financial flows, uh, global trade and, and global competition between uh, between empires and between um, producers, free trade versus tariff discussions, imperialism very clearly, he, he refers directly to, he attributes the fact that in Britain, you have workers who who own stock to the fact that they're better off and they're better off because of um, Britain's imperial possessions. He says that very matter of fact, matter of in this text. Um, all of this is in there, and among among other things that that distinguish, I think, his analysis. But I wanted to go back to you to you two, as in, what kind of economist was he then? Is he even um, a political economist, because I think he's already detached in a text like this from his uh, his economist professors or his uh, his economist teachers. Let's say uh, people like Schmola, um, Knapp, and and so on. And 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 for Misha specifically, is how you um, I invited you because you also told me you had already kind of run into this text. Um, which is more usually reserved to the specialist because it's kind of hidden in, in his uh, in his bibliography. But you had found it actually, and I was curious as to why and what what was your impression um, if you read him as kind of a source with uh, comparing to what the other things that were being written about the stock exchange or financial markets at the time that you ran into in your research. So who is who is this Weber, the economist, or was he? Was he still an economist or was he never one because he's someone, something else uh, in these texts, even if he's at the beginning of his trajectory in many ways? Well, um, as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in no way a Weber specialist, but, but I, I ran in, into it as a, as a student. That's, that's, that's true, right? More or less, no, not right after, but a couple of years. I mean, the, um, when was it? The edition was in, 1999 it came out right um, um a couple of years later um and and what struck me was um that this is the work of a um of a pub public intellectual is the wrong word this is the work of a, a work of a, a university professor who speaks to a general audience um um in this in these lectures to this, um, uh, what, what was it in Gutting? And if, if I'm not mistaken, I don't remember. Or maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm confusing something. The um, workers' but, library. But, 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 but speaking to a to a workers' association, the mm -hmm. liberal liberal workers' association, and um, and and um, so what struck me was um, uh, the didacticist. Um, that um, someone was capable of explaining um, <clears throat> um, um, a, a, a very complex um, uh, processes um, in, a, in a very clear manner. And, um, uh, and someone who is very keen to not fall into um, the moralistic discourse um, on Börsenspiel. And, and I think, and this comes back to uh, what, what Sam very rightly um, emphasized is that actually he ignores the, the this, he kind of um, um, uh, uh, puts away the, the question of rationality, irrationality, because it, because it's politically so loaded. And, um, and, um, and, 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 intellectually for him probably a dead end at, at to, a dead end to talk about this in this way as it as it was in public discourse where we would have all these condemnations of 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 of, of, of rampant speculation and and um, um that, that was uh, that was the area of of of, of political anti-semites that was the area of 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 the agrarians and and of and 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 of the um of the political right and and he kind of um wants to um change um the 
terms of debate, so to speak, and 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 and, and says, look, this is this is a this is a rational phenomenon, and 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 it, and it has real effects. And for your work, it has the effects that the prices of your um, of of your groceries go down, um, and 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 so this is to be commended. Um, so 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 I think that. I mean, I, I think that was um, um, very interesting to see, and also, um, as I, as I said before, very, um, very much that, that 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 this is actually an accessible, it's a, an accessible text, um, and um, which, um, of course, um, in no way makes it less of a political text. Of course, this is a political intervention at the very, um, as, as Sam pointed out, at the, at, at, at a very contentious um, moment. Um, um, but um, but but we would have um, Weber here intervening as someone who um, um, comes up with um, with expertise, um, who comes up um, with um, uh, uh, with um, as 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 an interventionist um, um, who who can uh, tries to. Um, Objectify the, the terms of debate. Yeah. Sam, do you want to jump in, or somebody have a question? Ah, mm -hmm. later. Okay. Uh, Hinak has his hand up. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, nur eine kurze Bemerkung zu Michael Sutters Frage nach Weber Handel Idealtyp anlässlich des Zitats von Kohn abgekürztes Bild der Idee des Handels überhaupt. Das findet sich in der, fast, gleich, fast wortgleich in Paragraph 1 der soziologischen Grundbegriffe bei Weber, wo er von der Zweckrationalität der Wirtschaft spricht und dann nicht vom Handel spricht, aber vom Handeln. Das reale Handeln verläuft nur in seltenen Fälle, Fällen, Klammer auf Börse, und auch nur dann anerkennungsweise so wie im Idealtypus konstruiert. Man sieht hier also, dass der 20, 25 Jahre später die Börse für Weber das so idealtypisch das wirtschaftliche Handeln verkörpert. Mhm. 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 Und vielleicht eine zweite Bemerkung zu dem, was zuletzt gesagt wird, die Webers Darstellung und seine Absicht der Darstellung, das entspricht völlig dem, was auch Schmoller versucht hat. Birger Priddert hat das vor Jahren mal gut dargestellt. Die aufklärerische Absicht der Schmollerschule, die Bevölkerung, vor allem die Arbeiter, instande zu setzen durch Aufklärung über das Funktionieren der Wirtschaft, dass sie sich in der modernen Wirtschaft rational, bewusst bewegen können. Ich habe den Titel von Bridats Aufsatz nicht im Kopf, aber das könnte ich raussuchen. Vielen Dank. Ja. Ja. Thanks, Hinak. I think you can send us the, the, the passage of, uh, that you quoted and maybe you could put, up, put it up in English because you, you quoted a, a segment of his later work to, to confirm what, what Misha has said. Just to 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 say it in English, and and also emphasize that this intention to to speak clearly and to enlighten, let's say, or instruct of the general public and and especially workers is something that comes from from Schmoller, from his um, one of his main references from the previous generation. Uh, though, though I, I have my my doubts if uh, Schmoller was this political or this incendiary. In, even though he Weber is very objective, he's very polemical in a way and, and not afraid of saying things that will cause immediate controversy. On the on the ideal type thing, there's a quote. There's a there's this beautiful quote where he talks about the economy as this network of threads, uh, interconnecting threads, yeah. which. Uh, I mean, I, I made a rough translation of it. First, he starts by saying what a socialist economy is, and that's one where each person is a single thread connected to a central authority, um, which will then uh, be like the puppet master of these, uh, he doesn't use the metaphor, but of these threads. 
But the current social societal organization, quote, so capitalist society, uh, societal organization binds everyone to countless others with countless threads. Everyone tugs at the web of threads to get where they want to go and where they believe is their place. But even, even if they are giants and gather many of the threads in their hands, they will rather be dragged to wherever there is space for them in that moment. And that's the, I would say this, this evokes an ideal typical construction, where at least um, there's echoes of how he'll, he'll conceptualize social relations later. And it's very plastic in a way of uh, social relations as a network. And there are there are many passages in this text where he, you know, provides his concept of conceptualization of capitalism. The first one, though, the whole impersonal character of capitalist domination uh, is very clear here. And um, at least in the MVG, this is this is quoted as a reference to Marx, and I completely agree. Uh, where he calls capitalism not the rule of capitalists but the rule of capital. Um, so as an impersonal rule. Uh, economic as an impersonal economic order by nature, um, which which I find very interesting. But then again, like you were talking about the question of rationality, he's trying to be very objective about the necessity of these fin of financial markets and the world that they play, and he's generalizing it from uh, with with examples. Right? What's the how if you compare this to a to a market? Like a street market or a market, a grocery market, and he goes for that from there and generalizes it. It's very accessible. I, I totally agree, but he has a very clear. It, he says on the one hand it's necessary and it's not rational, but on the other he shows you how contingent it is because in all these countries it's organized in different manners, with different effects, and he tries to explain why. Uh, because you have different strata, different groups of people that are. Um, involved with the with the stock exchange, you have different forms of state regulation over it. He this he makes very transparent, and, and there is where I think he goes beyond just a political economist, and he's already uh, doing a sociology of of the financial markets, even at this stage. I don't know what you guys think. Of course, he then will talk at length of like the strata of the. I don't know if it's going to be the trader or the. Um, um, the the stockbroker and the question of does this does this strata have an honor code is this enough to to keep the 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 game more or less clean entirely clean is not is not possible he doesn't think it should be aimed at anyhow this this I feel is where he's already doing sociology very much of the economy um, that he's talking about power relations playing a very big role in, in this very formal system with the threads, but he's refusing to uh, single out a, a specific segment and say they are the, uh, they are taking advantage. Um, they are, they are actually moving these threads. He doesn't think that's even possible, even if you are um, one of the billionaires of his time that he, that he quotes. Again, I find very interesting in a way, he's also rejecting any kind of um, anti-Semitic kind of imagery where this is, you know, some kind of space that's controlled by a small group that is taking all the advantage. He, he totally rejects this. He's only very critical of the small speculator, the, the day trader, <laughs> that is, uh, that has no function, that plays no function in this, in this, in this ecosystem, let's say. I, I came away very impressed as well uh, from the text. Edit. So I hope I can explain it. I had to read all the text of this uh, volume. And my impression was beyond these two famous texts of the Börse in uh, 1894 and six, that it deals with the discussion about this uh, law. And so there is a juridical dimension of Weber, which uh, is related to his, yes, um, early time um, studying under uh, Leaving Goldschmidt. That means it is commercial law. And the political dimension of it is 
that Weber wanted to influence the process of making a law. And um, as we uh, had to um, prepare these texts of the Börsen Enquete Commission, I was quite astonished about the material the uh, ministry made and collected. They made the international comparison. So they had a stuff of materials from the other verses in uh, foreign uh, countries. So I think the political intention of the whole process of making a good law has something to do with the position of Germany as an imperialistic state and nation state. So there are different dimensions of uh, political interests. And I think this was a preparation for Germany playing a role as a global player in a modern capitalistic world. And in so far, Weber was very interested to... Um, influence this process of lawmaking. And it pushed him at the top of uh, a political relevant young scientist and even as an economist, but I think it was a mixture of political and juridical competence he had. And not at um, the main top, it was a theoretical economic competence he had. So his interest was even more, I think, uh, to uh, summarize it, um, political, juridical, and national state interest to um, be engaged in this uh, debate. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Edith. That's, that's very enlightening, I think. Misha? Um, yeah, just to um, pick up on that. Um, so you mentioned that they, um, in the person and get um, um, commission, they compared different legislations, compared different financial markets, and that um, <clears throat> that element of or aspect of um, comparison um, by um, the comparison of. Uh, the comparison of the different national contexts of an ex intrinsically globalized phenomenon or global or process of globalization, I think is is is, is very interesting and um, and it is something that was that was very strong at the uh, um, at 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 the time. Um, um, for instance. Um, after the um, financial panic of 1873, so 20 years prior, um, um, people or um, commentators would um, speak of the distinct way of, um, um, you know, traders in Vienna doing, um, um, uh, doing business, um, as opposed to New York, as opposed to Berlin. Um, so um, even go uh, um, verging on national stereotypes of different different uh, ways of of, uh, of of trading, and and there is a um, great book um, on I, I just put the reference in the chat um, on um, the um, <clears throat> on the financial panic of eighteen seventy three and the, the and and its aftermath and then the kind of um, theoretical and 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 economic reflection it spurred, um, and um, the author um, comes to an interesting conclusion because she's asking why is in the church why is it the German context where political and anti-Semitism is so intrinsically um, tied to discussions on 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 diverse on 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 the stock exchange. I mean, happens in other places as well, but 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 um, but um, but, but but it is especially strong um, in the crisis of the late nineteenth century in in Germany, and the argument um, Catherine Davis, the the author, comes up with is to say. Um, Precisely because trading in Germany was relatively anonymous, um, in contrast with trading in um, New York, um, 
precisely due to that fact, um, conspiracy theories could, um, could gain more traction in Germany than they could in um in 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 uh, for instance in New York so so if in New York she says um you know Carnegie would corner the market everyone uh, everybody would know that this is Carnegie um whereas um whereas um in 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 Berlin it would be um um evil invisible forces that cause that malaise um, so this is, um, I, I think it's a very inventive and 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 and, and interesting argument um, 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 the, the historian Catherine Davis comes up with. I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on these um, themes. I just want to uh, bring it to your uh, attention so I can, um, I'm, I'm not in a position to judge whether um, her, her argument is true or not, but I, um, the way she presented it was was very compelling, and it speaks and it, and it, it speaks to that urge to compare that um, um, contemporaries um, in the in the late nineteenth century had, which which I think is a feature of imperialism um, um, per se. Um, so we would have um, um, this idea that that all these national economies are competing with each other and 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 thus are constantly comparing each other. Fantastic, Misha. The, the name of the book is Transatlantic Speculations, Globalization, and the Panics of 1873 uh, from 2018. The author is Catherine Davids, as you said. Thanks for the reference. We'll add it to the to the after the talk. Sam, yeah. Yeah, Victor, to come, come back to your, your question about was he an economist, was he a political economist? Uh, I don't think you need to categorize him. Um, I mean, just on your question, you'd have to compare him with um, other economists, German economists at the time, and you'd say, well, he's he's a pretty good economist. <laughs> um, and I seem to remember a few years ago, you and I had a conversation about they all used to loaf around in Faber's father's house in the 1880s. And there was a group of them. Volta, was it Nexus? No, no, Volta, uh, Lotz, Helferich. These were all quite important people. Um, uh, so they talked political economy in terms of the nation state and what was good for it. And I think, I mean, why I went into the political background, the, the political background was extremely dangerous. I mean, in 1894, when uh, Philip Eulenberg basically prompted the Kaiser to get rid of Caprivi. I mean, it, it was also the time of the anti-socialist laws that he wanted to launch, which also made the next move was a coup d'etat. Um, and that actually comes up 10 years later. That Weber is aware of this in 1904 with a repeat of it but it wouldn't have been known about in 1894. <clears throat> but I get the sense that Weber, going through all these institutions in Berlin, had a very acute political sense of what needed to be done. Uh, and therefore he was, as Misha was saying, he was presenting a very public front saying, this is what needs to be done. Now on the idea uh, of Misha's point about um, anti-Semitism and, and the anonymous and, and really the, the idea of panics. Around this time, America had a huge depression, uh, 1907, and it, because of the banking system, the banking system was rotten, still is. Um, and they started out the Congress uh, started a commission, just like the Boza Enquête, um, to discover how banking systems worked. And that started around about 1908, and they worked for five years, and they produced volumes and volumes of material from which the Federal Reserve System appeared in 1913 mm -hmm. in an imperfect form, but th that's what happened. And of course, that was opposed, the idea of a federal bank, by 
uh, Senator Glass um, uh, and St Stiegel, Alabama, Alabama and uh, Virginia politicians. And they were populists. They were anti-Semites. So you get this strong uh, prejudice, uh, explicit anti-Semitism, racism. Um, and it, it's all driven by these, these bank panics, which are absolutely devastating in America. I mean, the farmers are just wiped out. And it's because of the banks um, and their predatory practices. And so you get something similar. So we shouldn't be surprised that the Borson Cat took so long and was so thorough. I mean, the the um, the American version uh, was took over five years, and also had a very clever guy in it, uh, Paul. What was his name? Um, he came from the um, Barberg. Yes, came from the the famous Barberg banking dynasty and he was very much up to speed on how the London's stock exchange and banking system worked and uh, he tried to persuade his fellow members on this commission how to uh, have bank reserves at a minimum and have stability maximised um, and in some ways, he's the kind of Max Weber th figure in, in that commission. He was ignored um, because banking interests were, well, I won't go into it, but they were not rationalistic. <laughs> so you can see sort of Max Weber there acting as the rationalist, shall we say, yeah. All right, any other comments? And of course, I, I don't want us to leave without commenting on the fact or asking you to, to comment on the actuality of the text, if it's what's relevant, what's not. Because ever since we we scheduled this, we had the bank runs in the United States. Uh, I mean, the third biggest bank failure in history and then other um, minor bank failures, or at least banks that were seized. And, and 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 sold. Uh, we have, of course, here in Switzerland, uh, UBS and, and Credit Suisse um, merging. And and I wanted to hear Visha on that, <laughs> uh, um, just just very briefly. But is this a text that's still? I, I was surprised actually by how much it still explains. It explains very contemporary phenomenon, even if even if it's very clearly a text from before the. Uh, the crisis of 1928, right? It's it's before that, uh, the whole wave of regulation that comes after that. But still, um, is this something worth publishing and reflecting on with regards to the current difficulties in the economy? Sam? Yeah, well, I, th I agree with you. Um... I was very much struck that the world has regressed to, you know, Weber was defending a pretty unregulated system and all sorts of things could happen and did happen. And Weber's open to criticism on that, but he, he places where the risk should fall. Yeah, that's why I think it's an interesting set of texts and and you know going through the glossary of the Max Weber Gesamthaus were on this um you suddenly realize what the equivalent was today uh so that all the instruments and all the mechanisms seem to be there in the 1890s in a very unregulated form and the possibility of a free market capitalism within a national state context made sense. Um, so the question is, what has changed? So you can make this comparison. I think it would be very enlightening. How you would do it editorially is a bit of a headache. Perhaps we ought to think about that. 
um, maybe it's just those two De Helfer articles would be enough. Plus illustrations from, I mean, it's it's quite remarkable that in the Bundesrat um, Anschluss, the committee, they let Max Weber write the final report. I find that extraordinary because they were arguing, you know, there were representatives, different viewpoints in, in, in that um, committee of the Bundesrats. So they're all arguing. And then they leave Max Weber to write the report. Quite extraordinary. Um, which they didn't allow um, Paul Warburg to do in the American case. Um, so that there's some very interesting comparisons to be drawn. Uh, and why Weber... I mean, I guess the question then comes down to why should we trust Faber's position on the free market? There's an argument for trusting it at that point in time of capitalism. Um, so it's the kind of preconditions that he sets up about capitalism, including the nation state. And of course, the nation state does no longer contains capitalism. So that American finance dominates the world and dominates the discourse and dominates the main institutions um, and therefore it's um, that, that raises the question of American financial imperialism uh, and the whole move of the Washington consensus really to establish a financial imperialism across the globe you know it's a global zero uh, strategy it seems to me which has now gone into reverse under trump um and whereas weber is just saying no it's, it's a westphalian system so to speak yeah but it's it's we have these bulls uh, and these nation states speaks to each other through prices, international price um, discovery. I think that could be worth doing, yeah. Vishal, do you want to jump in for some last comments? I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of um, um, giving uh, um, contemporary relevance to uh, to historical text. Um, and as a historian, I'm all for historical specificity. Um, uh, and on the on on, and on the question on the question of, um, of 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 Credit Suisse collapsing, I mean, I can't tell you more than the average newspaper reader can. I mean, I'm on the same I'm on the same plane in in, in that regard, to be honest. So so I don't have uh, much to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to to add on that. I mean, what one can say is that um, but Weber when talking about um, <clears throat> about Termingeschäfte, about futures trading, um, is talking about something that in a very, in, in, in mutated forms um, um, is now discussed as derivatives, as, as Sam points out in his paper. And, um, but um, I'm not sure that I said, oh no, I don't think that it would be a blueprint or um, a, a guide a line for um, today's um, crisis. I think that the reflection on a crisis, on a, on a past crisis, as 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 Weber was undertaking as a, as a, as a contemporary of that past crisis, um, can 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 can. Can tell can tell you something about reflections, but not so much as a as a guide for our reflection uh, per se. Okay, yeah. Well, j j just to come back onto that. I mean, to go back to your point, he's it's a very interesting text about what capitalism is at that specific point, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. really the most important thing about Max Weber. He's the theorist of capitalism. Yeah, yeah. And capitalisms. Yeah. Now, if you take the position which I think I'm roughly moving towards, that capitalism will collapse under the present financial conditions because mm -hmm. its 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 dysfunctionality is so strong 
And Weber actually says in general economic history that if you got rid of the nation states and had a world empire, there wouldn't be capitalism anymore. Now that's in the lecture, and I've often thought about well, what does he mean by that? Um, uh, hence, this is actually on the chap end of the chapter on citizenship. Hence, it is the closed national state which afforded to capitalism its chances for development. Yeah, so that's what we've already seen. And as long as the national state does not give place to a world empire capitalism, it will also endure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that, you know, that would be the cue to set up. I mean, I don't think it can be pedagogic. Mm -hmm. uh, contemporary capitalism is beyond saving. Yeah, I'm tempted to end on that note. Um, <laughs> anybody want to add anything? Like, I, I like Michel's call to sobriety with the historical material. And above all, it's also a document of a, of a conjuncture in Weber's life. Uh, Sam was writing, we also don't know why he got, in, why he got involved in this, just as with the his involvement with the survey on agrarian, um, on the rural labor question. He somehow ends up with the most important task and the most politically sensitive task that puts him in in a, in a position of tension with the uh, with Prussian aristocracy. And in this case, his opposition generated a reaction on their side, and he was defeated. And and this defeat uh, basically took him out of these kind of roles counseling uh, the state for twenty years until after the war. I would say. And and I think it played no small role in his uh, withdrawal from public life. The fact that it, it wasn't just that he was individually defeated, but the, the political conditions for the reforms that he saw as necessary for Imperial Germany were clearly not in place. The, the, the political constellations, the allies, etc. And that but again, it's it's still remarkable that he somehow uh, is invited into those circles and becomes a decisive figure in them. He's in his early 30s. That's also important to to highlight. I think that's pretty uh, pretty amazing. But uh, Edith, do you want to say something to close about uh, Knut Barchardt, who who died recently, right? Yeah, um, I uh, think it was um, very good of you, Sam, to refer to Borchardt and his introduction and his. Um, studies research around the Börsenschriften. Uh, yes, Borchardt died this year on February 5th at the age of, I think, 93. And uh, he did a lot for the uh, historical critical edition. Uh, and uh, he was very excellent uh, historical economist, and I think he was one of the leading um, historical economists of our, um, uh, yes, Federal Republic of Germany, yeah. And so um, I think today with your paper, um, Sam, it was a small memorial, and I think he is still alive when we are discussing his thesis and referring to his, his research on Weber and the surroundings of a historical economy around about 1900. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Edith. I, so just want to thank our participants again. Uh, thank you to Sam Wimser, for Edith Hanke uh, for um, taking up the introductions and, and, and running the show while I couldn't, couldn't be uh, here, and thanks for thanks to Misha Zuta as well, and and to Brenda for the backstage work as always. So this will this will go online soon, and we'll we'll try and maybe put up some of the material that was mentioned. If you want to uh, go back to this topic, if you're interested, and but so yeah, wishing everyone a, a good weekend, and until next time. Thank you.